Welcome to another edition of the CS Podcast, where you can hear interviews with special guests such as Dayon Buchanan, Tom Waddle, Pierre Desir, Brent Barry, Ed Werder, and many others. Too big, too strong, too fast, too good. So be sure to subscribe and tune in to the CS Podcast on YouTube at youtube.com slash christianre722. Did you not get the memo? That's www.youtube.com slash christianre722. For great interviews, be sure to check out the CS Podcast. You are ridiculous! Welcome back to the CS Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Shanafel, and I'm now joined by 2015 NFL Draft prospect, defensive back out of Sacred Heart University, J.D. Roussel. Uh, I appreciate you taking some time to chat today, J.D. How's it going? Everything's going fine. Like I said, trying to stay in the storm that we got going in the Northeast. But other than that, everything's going great. Yeah, man, hope you're staying safe out there, man, definitely. Uh, so let's go ahead and get right to it, J.D. Uh, I see that you're from Pawtucket, Rhode Island, and, of course, the first thing I thought of when I seen that uh, was Family Guy, um, <laughs> of course. But uh, coming out of high school, you were uh, the team MVP your last year, and you participated in the Connecticut versus Rhode Island All-Star game. I just want to start off by asking you a pretty simple question. That is, coming out of high school, uh, why did you decide to attend Sacred Heart University and play for the Pioneers? Well, my path to Sacred Heart is, is, is a very unique one. Um, as a junior in high school, I was offered a full scholarship by um, Northeastern University, which is a CAA, CAA school. Um, and at that point, I was getting recruited by Boston College in Maine at the same time. Um, as everybody knows, you can't pass up a Northeastern University scholarship as well as a degree, which I would be getting in four or five years. Um, so I committed there. Um, was going to take my talents to uh, upper Boston, and unfortunately, midway through my senior year, they dropped their football program. Um, so a lot of schools that were in contact with me, such as Maine, Central Connecticut, um, the Albanese, I rejected them earlier, and then when I gave them a call back, um, like I said, midway through my senior season there, I had he given up all their full scholarships, and all I was offered were preferred walk-on positions. Um, Obviously, I was devastated. My family and I uh, went through a little rough period trying to figure out exactly what school um, would have suited me best um, between URI as an in-state um, tuition football player walk-on or taking my talents to either Sacred Heart as well as being recruited by University of New Haven. Um, so what kind of went through the process there is um, University of New Haven offered me a scholarship, but as a lot of people know, it's University of Haven's a Division II school. And not to take anything away from the talents that they had there, because they were very successful. Division II program, um, top 25 in the country year in and year out. Um, and then URI, um, I had a lot of friends, and I would have been very local to that school, so I kind of wanted to get away just a little bit. Um, our offensive coordinator currently at Sacred Heart, um, Kevin Bolas, who was recruiting me out of Sacred Heart, and um, he was the one I would give all the credit to to stick it with sticking by me throughout all the hardships with Northeast and dropping their program. Um, went up to one visit there, kind of felt suited at home. Uh, my mom fell in love with the place and come from a very rich Catholic background. And obviously the chapel and Sick Heart being a Catholic school was definitely um, an eye-opener for my mom. And her decision was for me to go to Sick Heart. Um, also, I had a little role in that as well. And then from there, um, we decided to go to Sick Heart route. And I can't say that I've made a mistake because I've become very successful there at Sick Heart. Um, and I'd like to thank her and my, my coaches as well. Yeah, you've definitely had uh, you know a very successful uh, college football career at Sacred Heart. I got to think you're doing well in the books as well. Uh, you mentioned uh, Northeastern State. I actually interviewed a, a tight end from there uh, maybe a month ago. He uh, you know he played one year there, and then once the uh, program went down, he decided to transfer to Eastern Kentucky. Uh, tight end Matt Langle. I actually interviewed him about a month ago. So uh, yeah, definitely uh, I'm somewhat familiar with that uh, football team going down. Uh, tough to hear. Tough to 
stuff to hear. It definitely uh, impacted your route. But uh, like you said, it certainly sounds like it's worked out for the best, to say the least. Um, J.D., as a freshman, you were really able to see the field right away. Um, your first year at Sacred Heart in 2011, I see that you recorded 25 tackles. You were also able to pick off opposing quarterbacks three times and even return one for a touchdown. Um, before committing to Sacred Heart, did you have any idea that you would receive as much playing time that you had and have as much of an impact on the team that you ended up having? Well, to be honest, when I first came to Sacred Heart, um, I came as a very undersized cornerback. Um, and being from Pawtucket, Rhode Island, don't get me wrong, I love the state that I'm from and I would never change it in anything in the world. Um, we do not have the talent that a lot of other states have. Um, so with that being said, I was not prepared at that point to be a Division One starting cornerback, especially in the division in the, in the defense that we play, where we play a lot of man coverage, you're on an island, and you know, it's a win-lose situation. It's 50-50, the better man wins. Um, so I went through a lot of hardships my first year, um, you know, adapting to the game, um, catching up with the speed, catching up with the physicality, because a 19-year-old redshirt freshman going against 22, 23-year-old, fifth-year seniors, or four-year seniors, there's a huge age gap there. So definitely me getting thrown into a line of fire early definitely prepared me for what came in the future. Um, you know, I kind of got my feet wet in there. I made the young mistakes that young corners make, and I only learned from that. I only looked up and I continued gaining knowledge as well as gaining um, the ability to play the position. Mm -hmm. You actually uh, went on to have a pretty solid sophomore year in 2013 as well. Uh, 25 tackles, two interceptions, two touchdowns. You guys went 2-9 and nine that season and had an incredible turnaround in 2013. As a team, the Pioneers finished the regular season 10-2, and two, won the NEC, and came up just short against uh, Fordham in the FCS playoffs. Uh, J.D., what, what you were able to do that season was uh, beyond impressive. You, of course, tallied 47 tackles, seven interceptions, and a touchdown. Can you just tell us how you guys were able to turn things around so quickly. I mean, I know the year before you guys went 2-9, and nine, uh, th that year was uh, Coach Nofree's first year as head coach. Was it just a matter of buying in? And uh, personally, how were you able to have the All-American year that you had? Well, I know after that 2-9 and nine season, there was a lot of people scratching their heads on what decisions the players were going to make. Were we going to cave in and be okay with it being that bad, or were we going to turn it around? Um, myself being, I know I was very upset after that season. I'm sure my accolades were, were all right, but it's never okay to lose. Um, I always pride myself in if my team's not winning, then I'm not winning no matter what I'm doing on the field. Um, so that, it started that winter. Right when that season ended, Coach Nofri had a meeting with us and all the players and sat down and talked to us about what we have to do to turn the program around. Because as you can see, we had good players. It's not like we had um, average players. We had great players. We were putting ourselves in great situations, and we just weren't winning games. So we sat down, and um, we just shot everything out there, what we had to do to continue winning. Um, myself, Kishortis, RJ, we all took it on ourselves to be the best at our positions and to make the people around us better. Um, me, personally, I know that I was rotating in as a corner um, in some packages and stuff like that, and I wanted to be known as the elite corner in the conference. Um, so I took it upon myself to put the pressure on myself in doing, in doing so, showing other people that putting pressure on yourself would not only make you rise to the occasion, but if you were to fall, you would only feel bad for yourself. So um, that's what I did personally. Um, I worked hard during the, during the winter, throughout the summer, and preparing my body to, to, to make the turnaround that we did. But like you said, we went from 2-9 and nine to the 10-3 and three season and losing to Fordham in the first round of the playoffs. Um, but obviously I have to tip my hat off to all the players in the organization, um, all, all 100 of us. From offense to defense, we all pushed ourselves throughout the winter, um, going against each other, giving ourselves an all, even if injury happens. You know, that's what happens in football. Mm -hmm. um, so that's basically how we turn that around. All right, so 2-9 in 2012 and 10-3 in 2013. Entering that season, did you have any idea that you guys would be NEC champs at the end of the season? Was that your guys' expectations? I mean, did, did you have any expectations to win the NEC? Well, well me personally... Um, going into the season, 
I, I was just I was just looking at our roster and I'm just like like wow we're stacked at receiver we're stacked at DB we're stacked at O line we're stacked at D line we have a new quarterback coming in but I had gone against RJ during um, one on ones when he was on scout team I'm like all right well RJ is a good quarterback now let's see him put it on the field and let it translate I knew we had a great running back I knew we had a great O line and a great deal and I'm like listen we have all the pieces to the puzzle to be a good team and when a team comes off going two and nine it's hard for them to believe that. Wow, like we're going to turn this around, this, this, and that. So for me personally, it took a couple of games to be like, wow, we're really like, not only do we have great players, but we mesh together like we've been having, like that we've had to do for the past couple of years. Mm-hmm. And um, after the first game versus Maris, um, we beat them convincingly, maybe by like 27 points. And throughout the course of that game, I'm looking at the score and I'm just seeing it continue to, to, to gather that, that we're meshing together. And then the, the, the following game versus Lafayette, which is a very good one double A program, we beat them at the last second with a last second field goal by, by a true freshman kicker. And after that, I, I disguised the limits. Because um, we, we won in convincible fashion, and then we won in stellar fashion as well. So at that point, I'm like, listen, we're a great team. The only team that can beat us is ourselves. Um, so once we had those first two wins, personally, what I believe is after we had those first two wins, um, we just continued to start from that. And, of course, uh, like we said, you guys ended that season 10-3. and NEC champs and making an appearance in the FCS playoffs. Uh, it's tough to have a better season than, uh, than the one you and your team had that season. What were both your individual and team expectations for this past season, knowing that it will be your final go-round at the college level? So, um, I, I remember speaking to one of my coaches, my defensive back coach, Brian Butterbush. And throughout the, throughout the summer, we were talking, and I would ask him, like, what is going to be the hardest? Or what's going to be the hardest team that we're going to face this upcoming season after winning the championship that you think would give us some trouble? And he told me that it's not a team that's going to give us the most trouble; it's ourselves. Um, after winning a championship, it's hard to repeat. It's even harder to repeat than getting to the top. It's harder to stay at the top than it is to get there. And what he told me is complacency would be our biggest opponent. Um, he wouldn't want us to go into games knowing that we're the better team, knowing that we can beat the team whenever, any day of the week, but that one day, if that team is better than us, then they would win. Um, so he wanted us not to go in being complacent, and that's what I tried to preach throughout all of winter um, to the guys. So going into that season, my thing was is to start winning early. Um, don't let teams hang around, because um, when you let the team hang around, they think they can play with you. They think they're on the same level with you, they think they're the same amount of talent as on the field as you do, and what we want to do is eliminate that thought process right in the beginning and try to win the game right from the beginning with staying through the whole game. Chris Schaffel talking with 2015 NFL draft prospect J.D. Roussel, defensive back, uh, the elite cornerback out of Sacred Heart University. J.D., I, I was able to watch, you know, uh, like I told you before the interview, I, I tried watching every game this season. I might have missed one, maybe two. Uh, it was another very special year for uh, the Sacred Heart Pioneers. You guys finished 9-3, and 5-1 and one in the NEC and won the conference for a second year in, the, in a row. Uh, unfortunately, you guys ran into Fordham in the FCS playoffs yet again and just couldn't get past them. Uh, 41 tackles and five interceptions for you this season, J.D., and uh, you now hold the Sacred Heart record for most career interceptions with 17, which I believe is now uh, second in the history of uh, all of the NEC. Uh, entering this season, was, was the record something that you wanted to accomplish, and now that you are the record holder, what's it mean to you? Um, so I can't lie and say that going into the season, that wasn't um, on my mind. Um, towards the end of last season, I remember one of my fellow defensive backs, Stephon Thomas, telling me, like, oh, you must be close to, to breaking the record. And, I'm, and, and coming from such a small state, you would never imagine that such a, such, such a reward is, is so near and so close. Um, so I did my research, and I looked at what the record was, and at that point, I believe I was four away um, from breaking or tying the record of some sort like that. And um, this, this past fall, I roomed with Kishota Spence, as well as him breaking the all-time rushing record at Sacred Heart. So, mind you, him and I basically are roommates, and he's chasing one record, and I'm chasing another, and, you know, sitting around all day, conversations like that spur up. 
And he was talking to me about how much it meant to him to be the all-time wrestling leader at Sacred Heart and for me to be the most um, interceptions. And um, that drive of him and I just talking about it just made me want to get it even more. Um, so starting off the season, I got an interception the first game versus Marist. Um, I believe um, in our first five games, I had four interceptions and just knocked it off the board right away. Um, <laughs> so at that point, at that point, I wasn't even chasing the record. I was chasing the wins for my team. Um, like I said, the, all 17 of them came at cr- cr- critical moments of the game. Um, and some, most of the time, um, I got a lot of help from my D-line. Um, we have a great secondary core that's been together for all four years, from Gordon Hill to Preston Sanford, Dennis Regan, um, and even the youngsters that are tipping in now. Um, so like I said, getting getting that record meant a lot to me, um, and even adding to it. So the next time someone else is coming after my record, maybe it'll be a little bit harder on them. Um, but like I said, it, it meant a lot to me, and it meant even more that we got it done early, and then we continued to win the championship. Because if we didn't win the championship, the record would mean nothing. All right, all right. Well, I, I definitely love it, man. I love it. That's awesome. Now, uh, you, you definitely had a, a very successful uh, football career at Sacred Heart. How would you describe not only this past season, breaking the record and whatnot, winning the NEC championship, but your overall college football experience at uh, Sacred Heart University? Well, I, I could not say anything more positive about Sacred Heart University. Um, the fans, the students, the alumni, um, the faculty and staff are all very supportive on the athletic team that we have. Um, a lot of my teachers understood when a big game was coming up, and not only would they sit there and talk to me about my own thoughts about their possible thoughts on the game, um, they, they would help me out in the classroom as well. If I ever needed extra help, they were very easy to find in their office hours. Um, they're very easy to talk to through email, um, as well as the lunch ladies at Sick Heart. They, they, they love the athletes there. Um, they accommodate us as, as, as needed. Um, so I would recommend to a lot of recruits that are thinking about possibly coming to Sacred Heart to definitely give it a shot on an official visit there or just pay it one day and go and see a spring practice or anything like that. It's almost shocking to me that now when some recruits are coming in now that I'm not on the football team anymore and I'm just having small talk with them and asking them where else they're getting recruited by. And I hear the Montanos, I hear the Villanovas, I hear the Albanese of the world. And I'm like, those are some big, you know what I'm saying, some big FCS or or FBS college programs. And you're considering Sacred Heart as one of your top four or top three or or whatever your top may be. It's almost mind-blowing to think three, four years ago, you wouldn't put Sacred Heart in the same sentence as a Villanova or as a Fordham or things like that. So... Um, I'm happy for Coach Nofri. I'm happy to see where the Sacred Heart football program and Sacred Heart as a whole is going from here on. Well, uh, there's no doubt that uh, even after losing seniors like yourself, Kashad Spence, uh, Gordon Hill, um, that, that the program is definitely going up. There, there's no doubt about that. Now, uh, J.D., when you first decided to attend Sacred Heart, if I were to tell you that you would win the NEC twice, hold the school's <laughs> career interception record, and be one of the top defensive backs in NEC history, would you believe me? Um, well, you know, it would be hard for me to believe you, but like I said, I would have had to tell you I would have had some great coaches. Um, I would have had to spiritually and mentally have worse wouldn't stay in a lot of hardship the first couple of years for me to get all the accolades and all the successes I got at the end. Once again, 2015 NFL draft prospect, defensive back out of Sacred Heart, J.D. Roussel joining the show. And, J.D., the NEC has a ton of talent, uh, especially recently. I mean, there's been so much talent to come out of the NEC. Over the last four years, who would you say is the best or most impressive player that you've played against? Is there anybody specific? Cool. Um, the last four years, definitely the NEC has produced a lot, a lot of talent and a lot of under-the-radar talent. Um, a couple of names that come to mind are um, – the Jordan Harris is of the world. Jordan Harris is a wide receiver from Bryant, I believe, graduated last year. Um, he was, I believe, NEC Player of the Year um, two years ago. He was a, a phenomenal player. Um, Dominique Williams from Wagner Wagner College was also a very good running back, very tough, very tough running back. Um, uh, Jeff Kovitz from Bryant University, a very good DM that they have this year. 
there's a lot of talent, and I don't want to miss anybody. I would be sitting here talking for the next 30 minutes. Uh, talent at the Northeast Conference has, um, but it, and don't get me wrong, there's a lot of talent at Sacred Heart as well, like you said, with Kishotis and Gordon, and there's a lot of upcoming talent that we're going to have as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's also uh, huge for the uh, the program that Tyler Doobie decided to come back as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. You know, and, and speaking of Tyler Doobie, uh, you know, what, what's it like going against him every day in practice? I mean, the <laughs> season he had, I mean, he had a huge year for you guys. Yeah, yeah, Tyler Doobie, that, that's my boy. I mean, him and I, you want to talk about friends that go at it and practice and just leave it out there, that's what him and I do. Um He's the number one receiver. I'm the number one corner. Mono, mono, let it be. Whatever it is, it is. And don't get me wrong. There's days where Doobie makes me look like I'm the number four corner on the on the on the, on the totem pole at Sacred Heart University. Um, that 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 man can do it all. Um, Doobie came in um, as a as a um, as a walk on, and you're looking at Doobie kind of a six foot kind of lanky lanky white guy, and you're like, oh, this guy is not good. And, and Doobie just finds a way to get the ball in his hands. Um, even since when he was on scout team with RJ, um, they, they had a connection since then. And ever since then, Doobie, year in and year out, has just made me drop my jaw on some of the plays that he made. Um, and a lot of other teams, when I speak to their defenses back, they're like, how is Doobie so good? Or how do you cover him in practice? This, this, and that. And I'm like, well, you know what I'm saying? I'm glad that I don't have to worry about it. And I'm glad that you guys have to be the ones to worry about it. But definitely Doobie coming back is definitely a huge, a huge pickup for Sacred Heart University. Um, that man worked very hard, and he's just like me. And losing does not sit well with him. And just like how I am, I'd rather, I'd rather win a million times than lose once. Like, I, I hate losing more than anything. I hate losing more than I like winning. Hey, it shows. It shows. And, uh, you know, like you said, uh, Tyler Doobie, I mean, uh, he, has, he has a pretty nice story. I mean, coming on uh, from the scout team, you know, he was a walk-on, and now he is the uh, undoubtedly the number one wide receiver for the Sacred Heart Pioneers. Now, uh, J.D., if you had a single out one, what's the uh, biggest or most memorable play that you've made throughout your college football career? Oh, the biggest and most memorable play. Um, I know there's been so many of them, man. <laughs> interceptions, I would have to tell you that my biggest and most memorable play probably isn't an interception. It's from from this past year. Um, so this past year we played Wagner College following one of our losses versus St. Francis. Um, against St. Francis I was hurt um, and I didn't play. I think I only had like 20 snaps. Um, we didn't do well through the air. I believe they passed for almost 300 yards on, yards on us and I take that personally. When a team passes the ball on us and is successful doing it, I take that as a shot towards us, a shot towards my dignity and anything like that. So going into the Wagner game, we already had one conference loss. I knew Wagner was a very good team at that point. They were tied for first in the conference and we were third. And I knew going into that game, if we lost that game, we would have had that finish third, maybe fourth. Or now a lot of other things would have to go on our way for us to even get a chance at the title. So going into that game, I was more focused than I probably have ever been in my life. Um, and at that point, I believe we were up three points. It was a 10 to 7 game, um, I believe, midway through the third or later in the third. And um, they, were, they were kicking about a 25-yard field goal, a cheap shot to say the least. Um, a lot of times, um, between me and the other corner, um, we let the other corner go off the edge and try to block it, and I'm the one sitting back in coverage. Um, and this time, it was me and Preston Sanford, and I told Preston at that point before he went and blocked it, I was like, listen, let me go and try and block this. Like, I'm going to get it. And me and Gordon Hill were to that side, like we do in practice a lot, and we were like, just, like, bro, let's just go and get this. Like, you know what I'm saying? Let's see how, like, how many steps, how long it'll take us to get there so we can prepare in the game. And at this point, I, I just, to be honest, once I saw the ball snapped, I took off and I blocked the field goal and then Preston returned it 98 yards for a touchdown, flipping the score from 10 to 7 to 17 to 7, which we later on went and ended up winning that game 23 to 7. And definitely that one game and that one play, I feel like epitomized all my accolades that I've gotten at Sacred Heart. Sure, the interceptions are good and everything like that, but it's, it's making a play when your team needed a play to be made. And 
be, to my opinion, winning that game for us and flipping the whole season from a possible third seed in the NEC to back up the first. Well, hey, there you go. I mean, uh, it definitely sounds like that one play was a momentum booster for sure. Uh, Chris Shanfield talking with 2015 NFL draft prospect, defensive back out of Sacred Heart University, J.D. Roussel here on the CS Podcast. And, J.D., just a few more questions, and then I'll let you go. I know I've had you on for about 25 minutes. Uh, it really has been a true treat speaking with you. Um, what, do you feel is your big, uh, what do you feel is your biggest strength as a defensive back? So, I believe as a defensive back, my biggest strength is, is just Understanding the receiver, understanding what a receiver would like to do. Um, playing out of Rhode Island, um, I was forced to go both ways, play receiver, play running back, and then as well play quarterback. And I always understood what I liked out, uh, out of a corner. If I didn't like I didn't like when a corner would press me much. I would like when he would try to play off, I could use my speed and quickness. So when looking at other receivers and um, how they run their routes, I can see what they like and what they don't like. Um, also, understanding what the quarterback wants, um, what reads he does when you play on or off man, um, when it's third and forever, who he likes to go to, when it's second and short, what he likes to do, kind of like his pre-snap um, reads and things like that. And I've, that's what I think has been made, made me very successful in the past four years. A lot of my interceptions are just understanding what the other offense wants to, wants to do, um, what the quarterback likes to do, what are his tendencies, and um, just just um, just mind boggling with with my defensive back coach and just talking about some of the things that other teams would like to do and how they would try to attack me as a player. That's why I feel like I separate myself the most. And how about a weakness? Is there anything specific you'll be taking some time to improve on during the off season? Absolutely. Right now, it's just all my four years. I've been a very a very thin corner. Um, I'm about, I was about at 5'11", about 178. Um, and currently with me and my trainer, my main goal is putting on weight. Um, right now I'm up to, to about 184, 185. My biggest thing was I was always um, a little thin. Um, when it came to a more physical receiver, like when we were playing in the Delaware, where their receivers were very physical, um, that would always be my disadvantage. I'd sometimes get boxed out. Um, out of routes, um, things like that. When it came to the tackling situation, one-on-one tackling, you're the last line of defense in the secondary, so let your defense play another down and make the tackle. So definitely being thin um, is definitely one of my weaknesses, but like I said, I'm consciously making that one of my biggest goals um, this offseason, and I think I'm really successful with that. All right, hey man, if you're uh, if you're if that weather's uh, too bad out there, man, you know you're snowed in the house. Make sure you grab some weights, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, JD, has it sunk in yet that you've played in your final college football game and that the next time you play will likely be in the pros? Well, to be honest, it hasn't sunk. It hasn't sunk in until a couple of days ago when I was speaking to my agent about possible. Um, Possible trips I have to make in the summertime. Um, a lot of people don't know this about me, but I did graduate with my bachelor's degree last year. So currently I'm in my master's program. Um, so a couple, a couple of thoughts that had to go through my head were if I would be ready to drop out of my master's program. Um, as you know, and a lot of people know, the lifespan of someone playing in the NFL is around a two to five year range if they're lucky. A lot of people do one year, two years, and then that money comes and goes, and then you have nothing else to fall back on. Um, so with me, my education is definitely a big deal. But like like you said, me understanding that I played my last collegiate game really didn't sink in until then um, when I spoke to Gordon and we're just like, listen, like I'll probably the next time I play against Gordon, if that I'll be playing against him or Chris Shortest. The next time I see him, might be in the hole or might be in the outside when it's him and I and I have to make the tackle. And um, it, like I said, I've known those those two forever. And uh, those are like my brothers, my family is like theirs, vice versa. And that's, that's when it really hits me when we don't see each other as much, uh, when we don't talk as much and things like that. So about a week ago when it really hit me that I'll probably never play. Well, I definitely will never play another collegiate football game. Right, right. Well, uh, de- it definitely sounds like you have the right plan. I mean, I love hearing that uh, you realize how important the education is and that football, you're not going to be able to play it forever. Um, now, J.D., let's say there's an NFL general manager listening to this very interview. Why should he want defensive back J.D. Roussel out of uh, Sacred Heart University, a part of his team? Well, I would, I would say one thing. I'm a competitor. Um, like I said to you earlier in the interview, 
Um, I hate to lose more than I love to win, and I believe any competitor, and if you're a general manager of an NFL team or any team at that, would definitely understand someone that hates to that hates to lose more than they love to win, and that's, that's not just at a football standpoint, that's a life standpoint. Um, winning isn't, I mean, winning is always good, but losing is not okay at any point in life. Hey, there you go, man. Plain and simple. Plain and simple right there. So uh, the NFL draft is a few months away. It's actually going to be here in the Windy City, Chicago. Uh, what's next for you? Are you going to be anywhere? Uh, tra- are you training anywhere? Are you going to any uh, regional combines? Uh, can you just tell us where you're at as of right now? So right now I'm training at the Rack in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, my trainer is Matt Ramos. Um, he's been doing a great job with me as well as um, a linebacker that we had a couple years ago, Nico Sierra, who just signed his contract in the IFL. So that, that's great for him because he's working his way up. Um, right now, my agent is setting up a pro day for me in Connecticut. I believe that we're doing a three-way pro day between us, Yale, and Central Connecticut. That's going to be around the later, um, the later time in March. Um, that's where we're going from there. Um, like I said, I'm preparing myself to run the best 40 that I can do, throw up 225 as many times as I can, and, and kill the shuttle like, like I know I will. So that's where I'm going right now. Hey, there you go. There you go. And last but not least, J.D., here's a fun one to end the interview. Uh, what's something about yourself that many people may not know? <laughs> something about myself that many people may not know. So um, you know, a lot of people don't know my name, obviously, uh, abbreviated JD stands for Gene Daniel. Um, obviously, that name is from my mom and my dad. My dad's name was Gene Danny. Um, we are of Haitian origin, and my first language that I ever spoke was not English, but it was French. So currently, I speak French and English for anybody that wants to know out there. Well, I, I certainly did not know that, Gene Daniel. Uh, but I, I got to say, like I said, that was my last question for you. It really has been a true uh, pleasure speaking with you, man. Uh, once again, congratulations on a very successful college football career. Congratulations on, uh, of course, graduating from Sacred Heart as well. Um, it, it really has been a pleasure speaking with you, J.D. you have anything else for us before I let you go? No, that, that is all, Chris. Thank you so much for the time you spent with me, and I appreciate it so much. Absolutely. The pleasure was all mine. And once again, uh, just, just best of luck to you throughout this process. It's, it's going to be a long one, but I'm sure it's going to work out just great for you. Uh, once again, thank you very much and take care. All right. Thank you so much, Chris.